candidates across the country who are running for elected office and talking about what they stand for and what they hope to do if elected this fall. I'm John Matthews, Senior Legal Counsel at the Justice Collaborative, and we're joined today by Esther Abagje, a lawyer who defeated four-term incumbent Raymond Den in the Democratic Farmer Labor Party primary for House District 59B, which includes parts of Minneapolis. If she wins in November, She'll be the first Nigerian American in the Minnesota legislature. Esther, thank you so much for joining us. It's good to see you. Thank, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So you secured the DFL endorsement during the primary over the incumbent, Raymond Den, after three rounds of voting and eventually won your primary. What distinguished your candidacy, candidacy from his and why did voters decide to try someone different? Thanks for the question. Um, you know, I think what was a little bit different during our primary was even before COVID, you know, we knew immediately that we had to get out on the doors, meet people where they were, um, so then that way they could get to know who I was, know who my team was, and know what my vision. Um, and then once the pandemic hit, we really pivoted to meeting people's needs um, as it related to COVID-19 and what resources they were looking for. So I think that availability um, and also that willingness to do work even before being in the job um, really helped with um, bringing people to our side during the primary. So doing that work and engaging with voters in that way, um, was there one issue that kept coming up when you talked to people in the campaign trail? Yeah, the main issue that I kept hearing from people either had to do with public safety, um, and this is even before the murder of George Floyd, and education. Um, those were two things that people continued to talk about. They really wanted to see equitable funding in education, making sure that the public schools were fully funded and that kids had a real opportunity from that. And, they, and the talk about public safety, um, especially before June, was really about making sure that the police were accountable members of the community. Um, and then that conversation has, has since evolved a little bit, but that was where it was before June. Yeah, I'd like to come back to that issue. Um... Before that, is, is there something that you've evolved on during this process? So engaging with voters, being out, you know, pre-COVID, obviously, talking to so many people, researching the issues, and, and also talking to elected officials. Is there an issue that you've evolved on um, in this moment? Yeah, I would say the issue that I evolved on the most um, probably had to do more with the education aspect of it. Um, so I was fully a believer of fully funding our public school system, our traditional public school system. Um, but there were so many more nuances into it that I hadn't you know, fully appreciated. So in my conversations with teachers, school board members, um, parents, and, and students, just really understanding their full um, assessment of needs, and then really understanding why, the, why that funding in that way would be so beneficial across the board. Can you connect, you know, talking about those needs, can you connect those needs and, and your evolution with what your particular role would be. I think people are trying to figure out, you know, city council, board of supervisors, state legislature, like how would you be able to, to help fix that? So with the state legislature, our role, particularly in the education space, is really making sure that those dollars are available. Um, particularly one thing that came up a lot was fully funding the mandates that we already have in our state laws to provide for English language learners and, and, special, and children with special needs. And so those were things that our school districts were always having to come up to fill on their own. So I think having the state legislature being able to kind of step up and be the first funder would be really helpful for those school districts, as well as um, recruiting and retaining more teachers of color. That was something that came up continuously all the time. And um, a lot of the support staff in our education system, making sure that they're receiving um, living wage jobs. Thank you for, for connecting those dots. Um, Esther, during your campaign, you talked about canvassing and encountering someone um, and helping them find the number to the unemployment office. That was one example that you gave. And I, you know, I'd like to know, I think our viewers would like to know, what should lawmakers be doing to improve how they provide services to their constituents? And um, that could be something like facilitating access to unemployment benefits, it could be healthcare related, you know, how do you view your role um, when it comes to that? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one of the biggest parts of the job is going to be providing for constituent services. So it is going to be connecting people, whether it's in the education system, public safety, housing in particular, which is going to be coming up really big now, um, and making sure that they have access to those resources. So one of the things that I'm really interested in doing is a lot of stuff that we're doing right now is online. But a lot of my, you know, people in my district do not necessarily have that same 
direct access to the internet that other people in my district might have. So are there ways that we can reach people where they are, whether that's through multiple phone calls or through doing events in the community, you know, socially distance and mass, but being able to provide information in a way that people can not only find out about it, but receive it and then utilize it. Uh, your campaign also focused on housing. Um, and so I'd like to talk about how you plan to guarantee housing for folks. I know that was a big issue for you. Yeah, it's still a big issue. I mean, coming into it, I, you know, I, as a lawyer, I worked with the Volunteer Lawyers Network um, as a volunteer attorney giving advice to tenants who were facing eviction. And so even before COVID, we knew that there was a housing crisis in Minneapolis. Um, but after COVID, it became even more important than ever to make sure that people had a safe place to live because that was how we were supposed to protect ourselves from the virus. So a couple of the things that I'm interested in doing um, is working with other state legislatures to making sure that we have that funding that is intentional about building more public housing, more affordable housing, um, but doing it in a way that doesn't concentrate areas of poverty. I've talked uh, to a lot of people on the phones about this and they're always like, well, you know, I've seen, you know, no success in public housing. And I think some of that issue is we're not bringing to people, bringing people together of different economic backgrounds so that they can learn from each other. There's a path upwards. There's that networking that happens in, a, in any neighborhood, you know, naturally. And so we want to continue to foster that. And I think we can do that um, through the government. And then in addition to that, I'm also interested in working more with developers to make sure that we're actually building at what is 30% of a person's income based on the neighborhood that they're in, rather than based on a larger citywide or countywide assessment, which, you know, makes the numbers very different. So yeah, there's a housing crisis across the country. I'm in LA County and it's, it's horrible here. Um, I'd like to know, is there a model that you've seen that looks to be working in terms of addressing houselessness and affordable housing generally? Yeah, I think there's a couple of models that have shown success over the years. Um, I know there was um, a model out of Chicago that did really well for a while because not only were they helping people get into more mixed income neighborhoods, but they were also providing them various support services that they might need. So that way they weren't just kind of like a fish out of water. Um, so I think that that's something that would be able to be modeled. Um, I also think now what's coming up, um, we saw it in South Minneapolis, and then I, I know in Philadelphia, I think it just recently happened, but more um, tenants in a building are coming together to do community ownership of that building. So I think that that's something that we should look to continue to emulate and figure out how we can scale up. So that way people who are living in a place do have some stake and some interest in their home, um, rather than always having kind of to rely on some like outside landlord or something like that. Yeah, thanks for breaking that down a little bit more. Um, and so I'd like to turn back to, to policing. You mentioned policing before. So during the campaign, you, you talked about divesting from policing to be able to fund things like healthcare, housing, education. Um, what can you do from the state capitol to, to help move that forward? So at the state capitol, again, we are the ones that are deciding, you know, the budget pots and, you know, how much gets where. And so I think one of the things that we can do, even though we can't dictate what each individual police department across the state can do, but if we are putting our budget and our, and our money where our values are, if we're saying that we value anti-poverty measures, we value anti-crime measures, and we know the things that disincentivize a person to engage in those behaviors, then that means, like you said, we are putting money into housing to make sure that people have a safe, stable place to live. We are putting money into healthcare so people can take care of themselves physically and mentally. We're putting money into supporting social workers, um, substance addiction, help, you know, people to help with substance addiction. You know, we're putting money into spaces that we know that once people get the help that they need in those areas, they're less likely to engage in destructive behavior. And then the other thing too, is we're also putting money behind jobs and creating living wage jobs because that is sometimes the number one thing that prevents someone from engaging in crime. So, you know, as a country, we're facing so many challenges. Um, you have a very ambitious uh, plan for uh, the state capital. I, I'd like to know how you're thinking about priorities. So like what, you know, what do you want to do first? Like what's the first thing you want to focus on and break down how you see your priorities? Definitely. You know, for me, especially, I'm going back to housing again, because that's, you know, really near and dear to my heart. So one of the things that I would really like to see changed in Minnesota is that for a tenant, if a landlord files an eviction on you, that it doesn't go on your record immediately. It would only go on your record once it's been adjudicated by a judge. Because right now what's happening is you may win your case against that landlord. You That case may get dismissed. If it's an issue of money, you may be able to pay that rent. 
But even if it's resolved and there's been no adjudication and you get to stay in the home or, or you move out or whatever, it's still on your record, which means it's following you maybe a couple of years later when you're ready to leave. And you're like, wait, I was never evicted. But because they had just filed, that meant that there's now something on your record. So I want that to change that. It doesn't actually go onto your record until after you've been adjudicated of an eviction. So that's a small thing to really protect renters. And that can lead to bigger steps to making sure that we're moving towards this guaranteed housing pledge. Um, I think similarly in, you know, in, in the job sector, you know, environmental justice is really important to me. And there are a lot of jobs that we know are happening in, you know, solar energy, wind energy. And those are the types of jobs that we can bring to this district. We can have training happening for those jobs in this district. And so I think that's one of the steps forward that I would like to see to incentivize more businesses to do that for our district. Um, and so those are things that I would like to highlight, you know, right off the bat. Awesome. Now, so speaking of jobs, you're a lawyer, which is a, a good job. Why leave the practice of law to run for office? It's hard to run for office. It's, you know, there's a lot of money involved. There's a lot of uh, just like internal politics. You know, why run for office? Why leave your, your nice lawyer job? Well, I haven't always been a lawyer. My first job was actually as a foreign affairs officer with the U.S. Department of State. So I actually did a lot of work. Um, adjacent to the legal space, but it was supporting activists across countries in the Middle East who were looking to make changes in their country, whether it was freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, making sure that those uh, protections were enabled, um, you know, women's rights protections, and then also access to capital for youth entrepreneurs. So it was a role of service, of, of providing resources to help people um, achieve the changes and goals that they wanted to see in their communities. And so for me, I've always kind of been like-minded on that. I also went into law as a way to merge law and policy to make sure that we were having better policies in the United States. So I, I kind of see this as like a natural progression out of coming out of, you know, being a lawyer. And thankfully, I've, I've had the type of law job that that allows me to use the law to help people. Um, you know, one case that I'm really proud of that my firm did was to gain to help with um, providing hepatitis C medication to prisoners in the Minnesota Department of Corrections. So again, it's always been people focused. It's always been service focused. And so I just see this as a natural extension of the work that I've done in the past. Your life is exponentially cooler than mine. Um, so were you, in, were you in the CIA? No, I was not. <laughs> would, you us, would you tell us if you were? No. I probably couldn't <laughs> tell you if I was either. <laughs> Um, so you also, you went to Harvard Law School, right? Um, and then now you're in Minnesota. So you must love cold weather. Ha! No, that is the one thing about Minnesotans. Not every Minnesotan loves cold weather. <laughs> um, we learn how to live with the cold weather and we know what to wear in the cold weather, but no, I do not like it. <laughs> so I went, I went to HLS too and I left immediately. I left New England and I'm like, I'm never going back. Um, yeah. I'm in California. Um, Very nice place. I like, I like California a lot. Good answer. Um, so your biography talks a little bit about your interest in the flute. Uh, a famous musician celebrated flautist Lizzo started her career recording in Minneapolis. If you could play any flute song with Lizzo, which would it be? Oh gosh. If she could teach me the way that she can uh, twerk and trill on the flute at the same time, that would be amazing. <laughs> that is, that is how for sure. Um, so the first time you made phone calls for a political campaign, uh, it was for your local Illinois state senator, a young politician named Barack Obama. Um, what's it like to make calls for your own state legislative campaign? Ooh, that was that was definitely different because yeah, from you know then state senator Barack Obama up to you know I've called for many presidential candidates, gubernatorial candidates. It's weird when you knock on someone's door or call and you're like, oh, I'm calling for me. Cause they'll ask you, they'll be like, who's your candidate? I'm like, I'm the candidate. And they're like, oh, wow. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's really different. It's definitely, it can, it's also kind of a humbling experience too because you know, you are putting yourself out there. It's like the most public job interview um, of telling people what, you know, what your skills are, what you think you can do for them and how they can support you. And, and it's just been amazing conversations along the way. So I'm excited. Yeah, well, I mean, it must be really cool for them too. I feel like there's a moment like that you describe where they're like, wait, you're, you're the person. You're, <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm, the, I'm the one who wants to help you. Um, yeah. That's really awesome. Um, so I guess like what's next? We have but like 19 
18 days until yes it's getting when close to that two week you, time period when do you get sworn in like when can you start getting to the work so we um the schedule for swearing in i think is like that first week of january or so um but yeah i mean but basically for a lot of us you know we've been starting to make those relationships as candidates with each other to get to know each other better so that way in the event that we win you know we have we've you know built that framework already and so one of the things i'm really looking forward to even before swearing in is continuing to build relationships with people finding like-minded people finding people that you know we can really get some good work done for minnesota because Going into next year, um, it's our budget year. There's going to be a lot of budget tightening, but wanting to make sure that we are providing for people's needs and that we're putting people first, particularly as we're still in this pandemic emergency. Can you talk about some of those relationships? Who are you starting to form relationships with? You yeah, can... um, you know, a, there were a number of uh, primary winners that defeated incumbents across Minnesota, and particularly in the DFL party. So I've gotten to know a lot of them. Athena Hollins, who I think has been on the show already, um, Omar Fate and uh, Jen McEwen. So, you know, gotten to know some of them pretty well. Um, and then there's a couple other either recent state legislators or people who won this year um, that I've also been talking to too. And so it's just been nice to, um, you know, learn from them, hear their stories and hear the, the their vision that they also have for Minnesota. Do you all have a name yet? We, we don't, I mean, we can't, you know, we're, we're, we're toying with the idea of like change agents. Some people have called us the Minnesota squad. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> we'll see. Um, I'm going to encourage you to get a name and you need a hashtag. I'm, yeah. I'm learning, learning Twitter. I'm learning all the things. Uh, yes. That's cool. So I guess before we close, I want to let you get back to your day, but um, do you have any advice uh, for people out there who are, you know, they're really, they're kind of pessimistic. They're, they're voting, they're engaged, but they're, they're not that hopeful in a lot of cases that there's going to be change. Like what's motivating you in this moment? Um, and, you know, give some, some rough folks, some, some advice, some hope. Yeah. I mean, I, I definitely get that. It, it has been a hard year. I think no one expected 2020 to look like this. And so, you know, for those that are like, okay, I'm going to vote, but like, what am I voting for? You know, I would really say that voting is a tool. It's a tool that we as citizens can use to express our voice and express what our interests are. But once we do that part, there's still so much more work to do. There's still so much more engagement you can do at any level, whether it's pushing your school board, pushing your city council, pushing your county members, pushing your state legislators, um, and pushing your Congress people to, because they're there to represent you. And so you should be talking to them, telling them what your needs are, telling them ideas of solutions that you have that they can back you on, um, and working together and organizing and mobilizing your community, not only just to vote, but to continue to be there as decisions are being made. I think we'll leave it at that. Uh, Esther, I really appreciate your time. Um, and thank you for joining us on the briefing. Thanks uh, thank so much, John. You, yeah, thanks to all the viewers out there. This has been our future on the ballot. Uh, full episodes of the briefing are available as a podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you uh, listen to podcasts. We're live again today at 12 p.m. Eastern, you're not going to want to miss a uh, Portland mayor form with Sarah Ian Aroni. I always mess that up. And Mayor Ted Wheeler. Uh, follow Appeal News on Facebook and The Appeal on Twitter for the latest news. Uh, again, Esther, thank you. And